Here's a look at the most fiery moments from Kitchen Nightmares. And this one right here was so sloppy that it took forever to dish out orders. In Season 3, Chef Ramsay visited Casa Roma in Lancaster, California. Opened in 1958, this restaurant was the oldest in town. At the time of filming this episode, the restaurant was owned by Nyla and her son Jeremy. Nyla was looking for some business opportunities, so she bought the failing restaurant in hopes of making it successful once again. However, since neither of them had any experience in the restaurant industry, they barely made a profit. While the bar used to be packed on most days, the dining room, which was their main source of income, remained empty. Since business was so inconsistent, there were days that the restaurant made $175 a day, and then there were days where they made as little as $9. Either way, running a restaurant with an average of $100 a day is impossible. And this led to a lot of conflict within the management. What's more, in just two and a half years of owning the restaurant, they'd almost gone through 20 different chefs. Some left due to a loss of pay, while others just had some differing opinions. At the time of Chef Ramsay's visit, chefs Drew and Eric were assigned with handling the kitchen. And according to the staff, Eric was the main reason behind the business's failure. Eric was so selfish that he never bothered to send the food out on time. And it's not even like he cooked up some delicious food. For the most part, his food was disgusting. On the other hand, Drew had a genuine passion for cooking. But because Eric expected him to do everything in the kitchen, it led to a lot of conflict and this affected Drew's productivity. Fast forward to when Chef Ramsay ordered the food, as usual, he had to wait extremely long. Not because the chefs were getting his food ready to perfection, but because Eric was busy taking a smoke break. Imagine having to sit through a whole hour waiting for your first order, only for the next one to take another 75 minutes. It's absolutely unacceptable to keep any customer waiting for that long. But it's even worse that Eric kept a Michelin star chef waiting for an eternity, only to be served putrid food. Of course Chef Ramsay was pissed. When he criticized Eric for his disastrous service, the man simply got defensive. It was a bad day, pal. Now you're bad pushing it enough. I get it. We understand. Eric showed absolutely no respect towards the famous chef. The way he talked, argued, and how he just didn't care showed how much of a trashy person Eric was. What the big problem is with you, Eric, you've accepted it. In your opinion only. There's nothing edible. During the dinner service, Eric was so disinterested that he didn't even communicate with Drew. If Drew asked any questions, Eric just ignored him. As the service progressed, food was sent back to the kitchen for being undercooked, frozen, and just tasting bad. But Eric simply didn't care about it. He was also too lazy to even taste his food. When food comes back like that, the shrimps, you never taste it? Well, you know, what can you do? And because he didn't get along with Drew and was sluggish as hell, the diners were left waiting for a whopping two hours. On top of that, the owners were clueless. Seeing the pile of orders and the ever-increasing wait times, Chef Ramsay had enough of them and closed the restaurant down. After the service, Chef Ramsay had a one-on-one -on -one with Nyla and told her about the biggest problem. Darling, he's not in the slightest bit interested in fucking in work and he's here for one thing and one thing only, hey, money. Jack. Ramsay was clear about one thing. If Nyla even wanted a slim chance at success, she needed to get rid of Eric first. Nyla, at first, was a little uncertain if this would be the best decision for her restaurant. But then Chef Ramsay reminded her of Drew. Then finally, Nyla did what she should have done a long time ago. The whole thing's just not gonna work. Okay, you, so what do you wanna do? We're gonna part ways. Okay, no problem. But this next restaurant had a committed owner and a chef who was just the opposite. In season two, Chef Ramsay visited Sante La Brea in Los Angeles, California. The establishment was a healthy food restaurant that also had some vegan options. Sante La Brea, at the time of filming, had been in business for 10 years and was run by owners Dean Hamui and his sons Arthur and Sammy. Even though the restaurant was in the heart of the city, they were $200,000 in debt and Dean was close to losing his house. Dean did everything including the cooking and cleaning, despite having a manager. Mark, the manager, and Aurelio, the head chef, were good for nothing. In fact, Mark had no clear role. Though he was hired to manage, all he really did was whatever he wanted. He was more concerned about how the restaurant looked and apparently had spent $5,000 on something as meaningless as a liquor display. Now, I say this because the restaurant was already running at a huge loss. There were definitely better things that they could have put their money into that could have actually helped the business. On the day of Chef Ramsay's arrival, Aurelio didn't show up and this clearly showed how much he cared. When Dean, the owner, tried to reach out to him, there was no answer. So, with Aurelio being a no-show, Dean was in a huge dilemma. But the show had to go on, right? This is incredibly predictable, but whatever Chef Ramsay ordered was appallingly bad. 
The first dish, a turkey melt, was so dry and disgusting that he fed it to the dog who was sitting with his owner at the next table. And the last dish, blackened salmon, was too dry and tasted way too fishy. So, after giving feedback to Dean about the awful food, Chef Ramsay went to the kitchen to inspect things since he was suspicious about the salmon. Chef Ramsay's suspicions were right since he found a major health code violation. That's One of the worst mistakes was that Dean wanted to keep Aurelio after he showed up hours late. Sammy and Arthur were very angry with Aurelio about everything. Not only did he lack promptness, but he kept the kitchen disgusting and a mess. However, Aurelio was very casual about it. What made the sons even angrier was that Dean still wanted Aurelio around despite that. He knew how this jerk worked and what he did during Chef Ramsay's visit. And that weakness led to Aurelio taking advantage of the situation. During the dinner service, when Chef Ramsay confronted Aurelio about the poor condition of the refrigerator, Aurelio's answer left Chef Ramsay in dismay. Did you see the fridge? The worst part is, Dean placed the blame on himself even though it was Aurelio's mistake. It's no wonder Mark and Aurelio took advantage of him. Needless to say, the dinner service was horrible. None of the customers liked their food, and most of it was sent back. All Dean needed to do was find his voice, and Chef Ramsay helped him find it. But this next restaurant used the only meat that should never go in a quesadilla. And guess what? They claimed it was their specialty. In Season 6, Chef Ramsay visited Mill Street Bistro in Norwalk, Ohio. This bistro was owned by Joe Nagy after he lost his job in food sales. Joe bought a livestock ranch and later opened the bistro, thinking that it would complement the ranch. The biggest problem about the bistro was Joe himself. He was rude, pretentious, disrespectful, and a liar. The bistro, according to him, was fine dining, but it was nowhere close to that. Joe also claimed that the food was fresh and farm to table, but that was all a lie. It was mostly frozen. Joe only liked to brag about his farm, and as a boss, he wasn't exactly what an employee would want. He was rude to his staff and disrespectful. Is there enough bread for dinner right now, or yeah. do you want me to do that part of the thinking too? The way you treat me is disrespectful, crude. Then you need to find another place to work. He ran the restaurant like a dictatorship, and on top of that, he was rude to customers. The meeting with Joe started off on a good note, but little did Chef Ramsay know how bad it would get. Well, the good start was mostly Joe bragging about himself. I am self-taught by old school Europeans, master chefs that had a liking to me. Lying to Chef Ramsay about fresh food is something that Joe should have never done. Because the moment Chef Ramsay would start tasting the dishes, he would know anyway. Whatever feedback Chef Ramsay gave to Joe, he didn't like one ounce of it. Whenever the famous chef said something about the food, Joe became defensive and argued with Ramsay. Well, we're not dousing the plate in oil. I'm not here to argue. I'm just telling you. Yeah, I can make you another one of these if you oh, want to just keep on moving. One of the things that Joe hated the most was when Chef Ramsay handed him the micro carrots that he used as a garnish. He found it extremely insulting, especially since Chef Ramsay handed it right back to him. The owner hated knowing that Chef Ramsay was going to go to another restaurant to get something good to eat. What else could the poor man do? He was starving and not one dish was palatable. When the famous chef returned to give his feedback, Joe revealed his arrogance. When Chef Ramsay asked Joe to give him some insight about his lunch, Joe was downright condescending. I've never had anybody critique my items that told me every one of them was a piece of shit. Chef Ramsay, however, made it a point to give his feedback, and this didn't sit very well with Joe. What was really funny was that when Chef Ramsay told Joe that he wasn't a chef and to stop pretending that he was one, Joe denied that he said he ever was. So, when Chef Ramsay asked him to reconfirm who the chef really was, Joe asserted that he was. I'm not a certified chef, but who cooks? I do. Right, so you're the head chef. Correct. Make up your mind, man. The worst mistake was that Joe wasn't taking criticism and failed to see what was actually wrong. You don't even listen to your customers, let alone your staff. You have a gifted young group of servers that told me more problems and issues in the first mm -hmm. 20 minutes of meeting them than you have done all Day. When Chef Ramsay told Joe to impress him with the dinner service, Joe became defensive yet again. Joe then told Chef Ramsay that the elk he found chewy was loved by his customers. By the way, who the hell puts an elk in a quesadilla? Chef Ramsay was stunned. However, Joe ignored Ramsay's advice and continued to be in denial. $35 for entrees that are inedible. Have a look at yourself, man. People seem to enjoy it. Bull 
It's funny how Joe, after all that, called Chef Ramsay his twin. The staff didn't want to tell Joe the truth because he was really rude to them all the time. And yeah, there was even a quiet sign in the kitchen, which is completely ridiculous. If there's pin drop silence in the kitchen, then how is anyone supposed to communicate? Anyway, when the customers started sending food back to the kitchen, Joe, as usual, wasn't in the mood to accept that his food was awful. It's safe to say that this man was the king of denial. With that, let's head on to this next restaurant that used the most expensive meat, but did they know how to cook it? Featured across two seasons, seasons 5 and 6, Chef Ramsay visited Burger Kitchen in Los Angeles, California. At the time of filming, the restaurant had been open for 16 months and was owned by Alan Saffron. Alan always enjoyed eating meat, and his love for meat drove him to open a hamburger restaurant where he could cook with Wagyu beef. However, there was a serious problem with his family. Alan and his wife Jen didn't treat their son Daniel as an adult and disrespected his girlfriend Wendy. Alan also stole some money from Daniel. Basically, when Alan opened the restaurant, he didn't have enough money to open it. So what he did was take money from Daniel's inheritance, something that Daniel's grandfather had left behind for him. Alan didn't even see Daniel as his business partner, and whatever important decisions that were made, Alan did it without Daniel. It's not even like he ran the show very well all by himself. Alan had hired and fired over 20 servers and 20 chefs, as well as changed the menu 10 times in under 2 years of being open. Alan and his wife believed that the staff were the main problem. They also thought that the social platform Yelp was conspiring against them by deleting all the 5 star reviews and only leaving the negative ones. Now, that's a really deluded idea. To make things even worse, David, their head chef, didn't get along with Alan and Jen. But more so with Jen. David, yes, you need to listen to me. It's hard to be belittled every day, so for me to come to work now is like almost unbearable. In the end, all the food that Chef Ramsay had ordered turned out to be frozen. And the Wagyu beef that Alan bragged about was nothing like the original. But Chef David wasn't even allowed to make any changes. He had to follow all the recipes that he had been given, and he wasn't even paid his wages. However, Alan and Jen were in denial. Did you add wine to the mushroom recipe? That's how you make saute recipes. I just asked a question. Did you add yeah. wine? Yes, ma'am. As for his paychecks, according to Alan, David didn't work enough to earn one. However, that was far from the truth. David often bought groceries for the restaurant, which he didn't even get paid back for. But hearing about not getting paid left Jen agitated. Where's my paycheck? Honey, you're missing the point. Jeff Ramsey then challenged David to cook him a burger, which he called a redemption burger. Alan, uninvited, joined the challenge as well and cooked his frozen Wagyu patty burger. When Chef Ramsay came back to taste David's burger, he noticed something really interesting about the patty that Alan had made. But what Chef Ramsay thought about it was really funny. I know it's you're eating lunch, don't worry. No, Please. I just made a burger. My ingredients. Your own ingredients? Yes. When it came down to tasting the dishes, Alan's burger was hideous. As for David's burger, Chef Ramsay loved the presentation, and this is what he thought about it. I mean, that's what I call a burger. Delicious. Thank you, Chef. Alan and Jen didn't seem to like that David was at the receiving end of all the praise. So, when Chef Ramsay offered Jen to taste the burger, she had the worst reaction yet. <coughs> it was surprising that Alan thought his Wagyu meat was better, when this is what the truth looks like. Because of the word Wagyu sounds glamorous and expensive, it doesn't mean you say it's going to deliver you the most tastiest burger. And when you deliberately choose to live under a rock, unwilling to accept change, there's no one, not even Chef Ramsay, who can help you out of it. But how dysfunctional is a restaurant that lets the dish sit on the pass for hours? So we're back at Bazzini in Ridgewood, New Jersey, a restaurant that was co-owned by Paul Bazzini and Leslie Bazzini. Unlike the owners of Casa Roma, Paul wasn't a newbie in the food industry. Dude had garnered recognition and positive reviews in various magazines throughout his career as an executive chef. However, the reality of running a restaurant soon took a toll on his sanity. I don't feel like me. I feel like somebody else. I feel like me looking at somebody else. Paul's passion for food, which was once burning bright, was now missing. This needs to be heated up. These are perfect. And the staff? They had their own take on things. He gets pissed off and he yells. It was a tough situation, and Chef Ramsay had his work cut out for him if he wanted to help this place bounce back. The famous chef decided to observe the dinner service, and, well, it was off to a weird start. You smell good. I smell good. But this is where it gets interesting. You see a crab cake? No. We see the crab cake and then it goes into the oven. Chef Ramsay discovered that the crab cakes weren't exactly fresh off the grill. Nope, they were pre-cooked the day before. 
And guess what? The dining table had its own problems. It's all burned on the side. All I can taste is the, is the food is burned. What's more, one customer sent the crab cake back, claiming that it was burned to a crisp. Chef Ramsay wasted no time revealing all this to Leslie, and her reaction was shocking. They were set off like yesterday. Did you know they were done the day before? Of course not. Mm -hmm. I thought everything was fresh. Leslie had never bothered to investigate what was really going on with the food because she assumed Paul had it together. And to add to the drama, the food was taking its sweet time to reach the customers. Paul, oh, that's still there. Yes, I'm working on everything. I'm talking about waiting for over an hour. And obviously, the famous chef wasn't too happy about it. It was damn time to take action. But do you know what he did? Well, check this out. Chef Ramsay times how long cooked food sits at the pass. And just like this viewer pointed out, when Chef Ramsay pulls out a timer, you're already done for. But guess what? He wasn't the only one waiting. While customers were waiting for their food, chaos erupted among the staff. Okay, these people are gonna leave if I don't get this one out. Paul finally decided that the food needed to hit the tables, no matter how disgusting the dishes ended up being. And do I even have to explain to you the consequences of that decision? What's wrong? Uh, it's cold. Oh. Obviously, the customers weren't too pleased with the food, and Chef Ramsay? He was at a loss for words. The dishes were either colder than the North Pole or cooked to oblivion. I mean, split the difference and you're there. But of course, things didn't end there. Paul was at his worst behavior and frustration was running high amongst the staff. What the fuck you want from me? Changing it right while you told me the first fucking time! Things had gotten so bad that Chef Ramsay had to jump in and pull the emergency brake. The level of frustration out there is intense, okay. so stop. It was literally the only way to prevent further damage to this restaurant's reputation. While Leslie couldn't hold back the waterworks, Paul continued to be in denial. But what? I'm one person with two hands. Paul, you don't, please don't start with excuses. That's not gonna help. But this next restaurant set a new record for serving the dish incredibly late to Chef Ramsay. Oscars, a restaurant in Natwich, England, had its fair share of drama when it appeared in season 3 of the UK series. Situated specifically in Natwich, Cheshire, Oscars took its name from the literary legend Oscar Wilde. And, well, it was proudly owned by Maura Doris. Maura invested her life savings into opening Oscars, so you could imagine the pressure she had riding on the restaurant's success. Adding to the mix, her son Lennon pitched in by cooking for free since they couldn't afford a professional chef. I'm the one that's closest to me, mom, and that's it, I've just stayed. And well, you can describe the offering at this restaurant as a little bit of everything. A good restaurant does one sort of food brilliantly, a bad one does 50 badly. Now, you must know that this is never a good idea. When the famous chef sat down to sample the menu, the paella dish took a whopping 20 minutes to arrive. And that definitely didn't make the famous chef happy. What are they doing in there? Mora, probably sensing the frustration, started handing out complimentary wine to make up for the long wait. And when the dish finally arrived, it was a complete disaster. It's a nice um, psychedelic pink crab stick. It stinks as well. But, oh no, the wait wasn't over yet. At this point, the dining room was already filled with frustrated and hungry customers. Has anyone told them there are 38 customers in the restaurant? But do you know how long Chef Ramsay had to wait for his second course? It took a mind-boggling hour and a half for his carbonara to come. However, he wasn't exactly thrilled with the result. You don't put vinegar in a carbonara. There's no egg in there, there's no parmesan in there. To make matters worse, the chicken that came with his dish was as tough as rubber. Someone in the YouTube comments pointed out something hilarious. They suggested that maybe the kitchen's plans was to intentionally make customers wait so long that they become super hungry and then they'd somehow end up liking the bad food because of it. A few of you might think that this is a clever strategy to get positive reviews and keep the cycle going. But hey, it's not always going to work in your favor. Nobody likes to wait. Least of all, people who are hungry. Chef Ramsay had enough and headed straight into the kitchen, but all he saw was this. So, um, who's, communi who's communicating? Who's, who's doing what? No. Yeah, absolutely nothing was in order here. But Mora tried to make a sly attempt to make up for the poor service by doing this. Mora's giving away over a hundred pounds worth of free drink and food. You know, I don't see the point of that. They lost as much money as they'd made that night. Doesn't sound like a success story to me. Anyway, moving on to this next episode, where Chef Ramsay visited Le Bistro in Florida. The kitchen was headed by Andy Trousdale, a British-born chef with European training. Andy and Ellen had opened up Le Bistro back in 2001 in the affluent town of Lighthouse Point. 
Unfortunately, the locals weren't too thrilled with the food at La Bistro. And it's not too hard to see why. You see, things at La Bistro during the dinner service were running far from smoothly. And almost immediately, Chef Ramsay noticed a major issue. I've just noticed two tables that are waiting to get their order taken. Okay. Only Ellen was allowed to take orders, leading to agonizingly long wait times for customers. And that wasn't all. Once the orders were finally placed, it took over an hour for the food to make its way out of the kitchen. So what was up with the delay? This is definitely a little kingdom here, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's a one-man band. Well, Andy insisted on being the sole chef in the kitchen, even though there were three willing hands ready to help. And Chef Ramsay absolutely hated this idea. When the food finally reached the customers' table, you won't believe what happened. Andy, she wants it well but not charred. Yep, it was often sent back, and that's a pretty big problem in any restaurant. Instead of addressing the customers' complaints about the food, Andy took an interesting approach. So go back and tell her, choose something else. Talk about an unusual response, right? Chef Ramsay was beyond frustrated at this point, and he had to actually step outside just to cool his head. But, well, soon enough, he was back. In an attempt to get through to Andy and the rest of the crew, Chef Ramsay gathered feedback from the customers via comment cards. And when he crunched the numbers, it was a tough pill to swallow. On average, 4 out of 10 for the service. Food, they rated 3 out of 10. Ouch, that's definitely not what any chef wants to hear. But in this next episode, one customer ended up being in tears because she didn't receive her dish even after waiting for hours. So you ran out of the fries, you ran out of the bun, and this is bad. I mean, crying, but I do feel bad for her though. So I'm talking about Jay Willie's in South Bend, Indiana. This barbecue restaurant was owned by a trio consisting of a husband-wife team, Rick and Trisha, and their friend John William. During the dinner service at this restaurant, things started off well with the new burger specials being a hit amongst the customers. It's really fresh, isn't it? The barbecue sauce smells good. They were loving it. But then, an hour into the service, the orders started to pour in and Steve, one of the kitchen staff, had a major panic attack. I thought you said two mediums. I'll make it, make it a medium well. This led to immediate chaos. Dude, I don't know what's going on. I'm up burgers. And well, Chef Ramsay was pissed. John. One of the 86 it when I said take it off. To make matters worse, they eventually ran out of the ingredients needed to make those delicious burgers. But then they came up with a bright idea. Uh, maybe actually it wasn't so bright. Rather than sticking to their fresh special, they lowered their standards and started doing this instead. We started making the burgers on sourdough bread. I mean, how could they serve prepared burgers on sourdough bread with frozen fries? Chef Ramsay wasn't pleased one bit by this. And what's the point in lowering the standard just to keep it on? It doesn't make sense. One customer was so disappointed with her burger that she ended up in tears because she had been looking forward to it for what felt like forever. I'm sure she wouldn't be leaving here without giving them a bad review. This probably hit a nerve with the owners, and under Chef Ramsay's guidance, they were ready to change their ways. Overnight, Chef Ramsay's team gave the restaurant a makeover. In the meantime, the famous chef sat the owners down and gave them a quick pep talk before they stepped into a fully booked service. Let's get positive. Come on. I am positive. Okay, good. However, when the orders started hitting the kitchen, things were off to a rocky start. Kept the customers waiting. We yes, gotcha. They even tried sending out potato skins without bacon, and at times, even the food ended up being on dirty plates. In short, it was an absolute mess. Customers were getting restless, and one table was fed up with the wait. With no other option in sight, she complained to the owners about how frustrated she was. No food, and it's just I just want you to know, this isn't gonna last. Eventually, she, along with many others, left the restaurant. Yeah, that's what happens when you keep people waiting for too long. I mean, nobody has that kind of time anymore. But nothing beats this next restaurant, which took a whole 8 minutes to whip up a basic Caesar salad. In this episode of Kitchen Nightmares, Chef Ramsay swung by Davide in good old Boston, Massachusetts. And once there, he placed an order for this. Gotta go for the Caesar salad table side, love that idea. And the fresh lobster ravioli. Alright. But things got pretty interesting when they started making the salad right there at the table. Who would have thought I'd be making a Caesar for Gordon Ramsay? Now, hold up, the excitement hit a snag when the salad making dragged on forever, like Chef Ramsay was left wondering, when is this gonna even stop? Finally, after eight whole minutes, Chef Ramsay received the salad and guess how it tasted. Have you just washed that salad? Because it's soaking wet. All the dressings just run off it. The lettuce went from crispy to soggy in no time. 
Yeah, so here's a little secret. That's what happens when you drench it in a ton of dressing and then let it sit there to soak it all up. Surprisingly, a lot of people watching also said that they felt sorry for the server, regardless of the fact that he was pretty slow and took a whopping 8 minutes just to serve salad. What's more, Chef Ramsay even gave him some useful feedback instead of being too harsh on it. Meanwhile, the next dish, the eggplant, was a total letdown too. Yeah, it's pretty spongy and horrible. Are they frozen? I mean, it wasn't even cooked right, and the lamb had this burnt garlic thing going on. Chef Ramsay then did some serious detective work and uncovered that the eggplant had been chilling in the freezer for a whole three weeks before it hit the plate. But wait, there's way more. The staff dropped the bomb that the lobster ravioli wasn't some homemade masterpiece like they claimed. They were actually buying it from somewhere else. What a twist! And this next restaurant was wild, considering the folks that opened it had zero idea what they were doing. Chef Ramsay traveled all the way to Boston to visit La Galleria 33, an Italian restaurant. Sisters Rita and Lisa opened the restaurant in 2006, right across from their father's successful restaurant. Their competition wasn't only with their father, but also the 80 other restaurants around. Rita and Lisa weren't only poor at handling the business, but they were also unprofessional. Rita smoked way too much, and Lisa drank in front of the customers. On top of that, the head chef of the restaurant was Rita's husband, Doug. Doug wasn't a trained chef, and the only training he got was from Lita and Reese's dad since he worked with him previously. In an interview, Chef Ramsay talked about the restaurants that gave him headaches, as well as restaurants that gave him good times, and La Galleria 33 was one of his best memories. He said, During this time, I visited over a hundred restaurants meeting and trying to help, or in some cases failing to help, some of the most weird and wonderful people. Of course, Amy's Baking Company is a standout along with Bonaparte's, but there were good times too, the lovely sisters at La Galleria and Mama Sherry's to name but two. But let's discuss the server that left everyone in a bind. I'm talking about the notorious Sarah. Many viewers believe that Sarah intentionally served Chef Ramsay wine instead of water. Remember this? I think he said water, water oh, Sarah, honey. Oh, water? Man. Oh, I'm water sorry. Base. One YouTube user also gave an explanation as to why Sarah may have done that. According to him, she just wanted to bring Lisa's drinking issue to the surface. Lisa loves wine. She likes to drink. While Rita hoped that Chef Ramsay didn't order the seafood ravioli, Sarah did this. Seafood ravioli special? When Rita confronted Sarah about it, her response left me stunned. That he will know about it. This server was here to do some major damage. Later, when everyone gathered for a meeting the next day, Rita called out to the staff for being lazy. But Sarah disagreed with everything she said. Never customers in here till 7 o'clock. Does that give you the right yes, to you don't like? That's not true. And before you know it, things got really intense. Rosa, how many days do you come in late? Say every day? If Sarah was the one who left me in splits, this revelation left me in shock, and I'm sure it's gonna do the same for you too. Miguel, you scratch your b in the dining room. Come on. It's inappropriate. While the servers agreed to be lazy, Sarah stood up for herself by saying this. I'm not, I'm sorry, I disagree. I'm not lazy. I'm sorry. Sarah disagreed with everything the owner said, and she was quite firm in her defense. Sarah! No, sorry. Sorry, yes, Lisa. No, no. Lisa. Things were getting heated, with accusations flying through the air from all directions. That's when Lisa made another revelation about Sarah. Lisa said that there were servers that didn't work with her because she hogged tips, but what did Sarah have to say about that? Listen to this for yourselves. I see the people, you guys the ones who see the people. When Sarah was hired, Pat was supposed to receive 20% of the tips from her, but he never received it. But guess what? Sarah continued to deny every bit of it too. And that's he's not seen it. No, he's no. not. No. She wasn't ready to accept that she was in the wrong. Her reason was that she worked her ass off and needed to make money, but so did Pat, right? I was working my ass that day. So was he! Everybody agreed with whatever Lisa said about Sarah, but Sarah was beginning to get a little pissed off. It suddenly felt like everyone had turned their backs on her. Sorry, I'm going home. Thank God. The whole problem with Sarah was that she wasn't ready to take responsibility. Right from hogging tips to disliking the owners, things could never be smooth with so much animosity between the staff. But these two former waitresses bought a restaurant without giving it a single thought, but what made it worse was their waiters. Let's head over to a restaurant in West Babylon called Classic American. Owned by best friends Colleen and Naomi, both owners used to work at the restaurant as waitresses before buying it in 2000. Colleen made her son the chef and her boyfriend Dom the manager. However, none of them were useful and the restaurant was nowhere near a Classic American. 
Dom might have been useless, but somehow he managed to make the viewers laugh. One Reddit user made a post about Dom and how he found him hilarious. Even though he was able to crack us up, he never did a good job. In fact, Dom should have never been a manager in the first place, but I guess everything was done on a whim. Out of all the problems, the servers at this place were the main issue. They lacked professionalism and were always busy wasting time. The waitresses, they're texting in between working. Colleen and Naomi, who should have stepped up, never said anything to them. Ashley, one of the waiters, had worked for 10 years. Knowing how the restaurant wasn't making any money, you'd expect her to quit sooner. But I guess it's the environment that Colleen and Naomi created that made them stay. I mean, which owner or boss would like to see their employees on their phones rather than working? Well, Ashley's reason for staying back wasn't what I thought it would be. Listen to this. It's like a little family. Great. However, one thing I did like about Ashley was that she admitted her mistakes. When Ramsey had a staff meeting after the disastrous service, Colleen spoke about the phone problem and Ashley immediately admitted it. You text when customers are... Wow. Even though Ashley didn't do an impressive job as a waiter, she definitely impressed the viewers with her looks. One of the viewers also wrote that he wouldn't mind receiving Ashley's message while he was in the middle of his dinner. Well, she might be one of the worst waitresses, but she did end up making a few fans. Speaking of the worst, there's one other waitress that comes to mind. Although she didn't get much attention on the show, the few minutes of footage that she did get were totally worth it. I'm talking about the waitress Nicole at Bella Luna in Easton, Pennsylvania. While Rosaria, the owner, was in denial, Tracy, the manager, was desperately trying to put the restaurant on the map. As for Nicole, she was in her own wild world. She was the first server to attend to Chef Ramsay when he sat down to taste his food. And well, when he asked her what was wrong with the place, this is what she had to say. Management, not focusing on what they're supposed to be doing. Well, I can't deny that what she said was the truth, but it's how she said it that gets me every time. When Chef Ramsay asked her to elaborate on the issues further, this is what she had to say. There's a lot of name calling, disrespectfulness in the back. Well, one way or the other, Ramsay at least found out what was happening at the back end of the restaurant. However, of course, he also thought that her behavior was strange, so he checked with Tracy if he could trust her. And the way Tracy responded was epic. She seems like a nice girl. No. What do you mean? No. Out of her mind. Tracy then went on to speak about this muddled employee when she said this. Nicole is a moron. Nicole needs to be out of here. Well, I think that pretty much sums up what Nicole was like at her job. She clearly sucked at it. Viewers soon pointed out that they felt like Nicole was as high as a mountain. And I simply can't help but agree. She definitely was. So these were some of the worst kitchen nightmares waiters ever. But who knows, there may be more employees who are hell-bent on exposing the owners in the future.